Chloe Chow made history on the night of April 25th when she became the first woman of color ever to win an Oscar for Best Director. Her Nomadland also took home two more trophies for Best Picture and Best Leading Actress. As Zhao made headlines around the globe, China went dead silent. Live broadcast of this historical event was banned in the country as the government issued a media gag order. Not a single word about it was uttered on TV, nor anything mentioned in the papers or a single picture posted online, as if it had never happened. It is a little eerie that this can still happen today in the information age. Did Chloe Zhao or Nomadland hit a raw nerve? What is happening between China and Hollywood? I'm Sharon, and this is Straight Talk. Things could not have been more different two months ago when Chloe Zhao won her Golden Globes Award. China's Global Times held her as a pride of China. It also confirmed that No My Land was to be released in the Chinese mainland on April 23rd. That day has come and gone. There is still no sign of the film being scheduled for release in China. Nobody expected No My Land would run into any problems with the Chinese government. After all, the film exposed the dark side of the capitalism. Many believe it has something to do with what Zhao said several years ago about lies being everywhere in China, and that she considered herself an American. Although Zhao's comments may have embarrassed the authorities, and I know China must have been upset by another documentary on Hong Kong protests being nominated for an Oscar, I doubt they are what caused China to completely abandon coverage of the Academy Awards. Why would I say that? Because China could have easily cut out clips that it deems inappropriate, just like how it has been done many times before. What I'm thinking is, Beijing has this tendency to act particularly aggressively when things get tough for them, partly because they're crazy, partly because they don't want to appear weak. Given that China and US relations are icy cold at the moment, I think Beijing is taking this opportunity to make a strong statement to America with the rest of the world watching, we're not happy with you and we'll deal with it our way. From a more positive angle, it is a sign that Beijing feels threatened by the current situation. Did you know China had problems the very first time broadcasting the Academy Awards live nearly 30 years ago? In 1993, Hollywood's A-list actor Richard Gere, a Buddhist and a staunch supporter of the Dalai Lama, called out to Deng Xiaoping at the ceremony. Where we could all kind of send love and, and truth and a kind of sanity to Deng Xiaoping right now in Beijing, that he will take his troops and take the Chinese away from Tibet and allow these people to live as free, independent people again. China responded by banning live coverage of Oscars for the next 10 years and placing Mr. Gear on its blacklist, where he remains even now. Although broadcasting resumed in 2003, China has since been keeping a close eye on what's being said and sanitizing it as it sees fit. But if you think China only controls what Chinese see at home, I'm afraid you're in for a not so pleasant surprise. That is because Beijing started to see the leverage it has over the foreign filmmakers and it began to use it to influence the content to their advantage. The leverage is its huge market. China now produces the second largest box office only behind North America. It may have even overtaken America during the pandemic. Each year, only a few dozen Hollywood films are released in China, and the government has total control over who gets in and who does not. Their decision often makes or breaks a movie. This is a tight leash that China keeps on Hollywood. As a result, the Hollywood producers have been wooing the Chinese authorities, not only by avoiding what may potentially upset the CCP, but also adding content that would appease the communist government. This allows Chinese propaganda to creep in. Remember in Marvel's Doctor Strange, uh, Cumberbatch's teacher, the ancient one played by Tilda Swinton? Did you know the original character in the comic books was a Tibetan monk and an Asian looking man? How was it changed to a good-looking white woman? Uh, one of the screenwriters, Robert Cargill, revealed the inner workings in a podcast interview with DoubleToasted.com. He originates from Tibet, so if you acknowledge that Tibet is a place and that he's Tibetan, you risk um, 
uh, alienating one billion people who think that that's bullshit uh, and risk the Chinese government going, hey, you know, one of the biggest film... Uh I would say the degree of sensitivity and caution Marvel showed was remarkable. Compared to Doctor Strange, Looper, created by Endgame Entertainment, took the precaution to a new level. Looper is a time travel sci-fi movie about a hitman called Joe, played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who arrives in Shanghai around 2074 to kill a future version of himself, played by Bruce Willis. Chinese media company DMG produced, developed, and partially financed the Looper. It subsequently marketed and distributed the movie. According to Chris Fenton, the former head of DMG, who spoke to NTD TV in a recent interview, DMG got the original movie setting switched from Paris to Shanghai. So in the case of Looper, we actually took a movie that was supposed to take place in the future in France, and we actually altered it so that in the future it took place in China. And not only did we alter it so it took place in China in the future, but we worked with the Chinese municipal government to actually design the skyline of Shanghai in the way they envisioned Shanghai looking 40 years in the future, in the way that it would make Shanghai look like the city of the future, the center of the world. And the center of the world is China, and Shanghai was the most innovative and technologically advanced city on Earth. The point of China being the future is underlined in the movie, as Abe, played by Jeff Daniels, tries to persuade Joe not to move to France. You're going to get out, you're going to go overseas, right? Studying up your Mandarin? French. Why the fuck French? I'm going to France. You should go to China. I'm going to France. I'm from the future. You should go to China. I'm going. Okay, we got it. We got it. China is a place to be. Uh, tell me, if this is not brand advertisement, what is this? Looper received special treatments. It opened at the start of the Golden Week, a privilege rarely given to a foreign film. DMG co-founder Daniel Mintz denied that they were trying to curry favor with the China market by incorporating Chinese elements. They did it because they made the film more interesting, so he said. Do you believe him? In fact, his top executive proved him wrong years later. Chris Fenton took his former employer DMG to court in 2019 for breach of contract. I managed to get a copy of the original legal document he filed. It is 127 pages long, but full of fascinating facts. As it turned out, the reason Looper was given a decent release date, rarely given to a foreign film, was because the film was not considered a foreign film to begin with, thanks to all the cooperative work done with China. It was treated as a co-production slash local production, and hence not subjected to the quota restrictions that would normally apply to a foreign film. It quickly became a business model for DMG. Working with the Hollywood studios as a gatekeeper for the Chinese market, making sure the content went down well with the authorities, sharing revenue with the Chinese government, and securing the status of local or co-production for the American films to get ahead with the Chinese market. Many movies operated this way, including Iron Man 3. I bet you didn't realize Iron Man 3 was partly a Chinese production, did you? Marvel Studio worried that the ancient villain in the plot, the Mandarin, would upset the Chinese censors, causing them to lose a lucrative market. To get around this problem, they had a white actor with a British accent play the role. Fortune cookies aren't even Chinese. <laughs> Some guy over here. They're made by Americans based on the, based on the Japanese recipes. Hey. Do you know the last time a major Hollywood studio made a movie that portrayed the Chinese Communist government as an oppressor? Almost a quarter century ago, in 1997, with Seven Years in Tibet starring Brad Pitt. That is how long it has been. Through all those years, Poor Russia remains the go-to enemy of every democracy on the big screens and perhaps consequently in people's minds. Hollywood is so well behaved toward China, thanks to companies like DMG. Fenton admitted this. 
how I was trying to get Marvel um, working with the plot of Iron Man 3 in order to make it uh, appease the, the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP. And she really felt like I was pushing the envelope and pandering and kowtowing a little too much to what the directive was of the Chinese government. And in the middle of that moment, she said, hey, don't you think that you might be feeding the beast a little too much. And I said, no, 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 no. This is just the way it works. If you want to get your product and service into China, you got to appease the government. You got to make sure the CCP is okay with what your product and service is and how you're messaging it to the populace there. That's the only way you can get it in. But did you know the Chinese media company DMG was actually founded by Americans? China couldn't have achieved half of what it has achieved, good or bad, without the help from the West. DMG was co-founded by a California businessman, Daniel Mintz, with his Chinese-American wife, Bing Wu. Because they were US citizens and not permitted to set up a Chinese company, their shares were held by another Chinese partner, mysterious billionaire Peter Xiao. To give you a rough idea of the troubles this company was entangled in, the mysterious Chinese partner, Peter Xiao, was believed to have ties to the Chinese military and had a problem with gambling. While very little information about him is available publicly, he was mentioned in a piece published in the South China Morning Post in 2017 as one of the Chinese high rollers who had left behind millions in unpaid gambling debt in Singapore. His share? 12 million US dollars. That's just with one casino. The MG Group was once investigated by the American government for suspicion of bribery in China. Fenton successfully defended their practice, but later admitted that he might have been misled. In his lawsuit against the MG, he said he came to the realization that some information had been withheld from him at that time. According to Fenton, the founders engaged in reckless risk-taking and complex financial transactions to get money out of China. They ended up fleeing China and left the DMG's presence in China in shambles, with hundreds of employees losing their jobs. DMG became a list company in China in 2014. In its heydays, it reached six billion US dollars in market cap. By the time it was delisted in 2019, the company had lost 97% of its value. If money becomes the sole driver of a business, you will end up losing your soul and the business. We note the Chinese Communist government poses a threat to us all. The threat actually comes from the corruptive values and practices it spreads to whomever it comes into contact with. Fenton had a rude awakening and came to the ultimate realization that what he and his colleagues had done was detrimental. But it wasn't until many years later that I realized not only were we feeding the dragon, which is China, too much, but we were doing it in a way that was making the dragon so strong that at some point in the future, we would never be able to control it. And that's where we are today. He wrote a book, Feeding the Dragon, to share his story. By the way, I've posted a link to the full interview Fenton did with NTDTV. It's worth a watch. What I'm trying to say here is, the China problem that we're facing today didn't happen on its own, nor did it happen overnight. It will take some real awakening, hard work, and even some short-term sacrifices to regain our precious freedom and security. This is it for today. I'd love to hear your comments. Please also like and share it if you have enjoyed watching it. More importantly, don't forget to subscribe and click the little bell to turn on your notification for future episodes. Thank you for watching. Until we meet again, take care.